Good evening. Welcome to the September still in September meeting of the White County Historical Society. Um, I'm going to make one announcement before I begin it that we usually make at the end of the meeting. Normally we know our program ahead of time, and it happened that we've had a change at the last minute. So you should have to watch your newsletter on the program. So that's the best I can tell you. I, I really don't know where we're going to October. But November, uh, thirsty old timers will know Bob Lambert, one of the boys that his parents had the farm where Lambert, uh, is that Lambert Harris? Lambert? Yes, Harris. Harris, okay, it is. And uh, he will be speaking to us on uh, the beginnings of the Ascension Service. And so I'd really like to get the word out for the November meeting that Bob Lambert will be here. So if uh, you happen to know him and the family, we'll please pass the word around to others that you think might be interested. Um, just wanted to share that before I forgot. I want to be a little discombobulated tonight. How's that for a 50 cent word? Discombobulated. So I uh, want to call on, uh, is, do we have anyone from Arts Council here tonight? Okay, uh, Patsy, uh, off the top of your head, this is really putting you on the spot. I got to tell about Patsy though. She's uh, <laughs> did the program been, about a while back on the uh, Book on Cersei. Can you hold that up for us? No, the book. Are you looking for oh, the book? Good. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, uh, if uh, the Arts Council, I know, is starting a new show, but I, I forgot the name. So you I have to remember. Okay. But, uh, but they are having an open house next week. I believe. Next week, open house. Okay. So, uh, and then uh, Tom Bird is he has a title now. He's with Sons of Veterans, never misses a meeting here, and he is the Heritage Defense Coordinator for the state of Arkansas. So uh, Tom is in the back, and Tom, tell us what's going on with Sons of Veterans. Uh, well, as everybody knows, we're still working in the Helen area and trying to get it coordinated. In the last uh, five weeks, I've been in five events. Of course, since the last time I was here, we rededicated the marker down at the 10 Mile House. It was there Whiting Highway 5, and they had to move the marker back, and we did a rededication down there. If you ever get a chance to go there, go there. It is beautiful. And of course, you know, we did the baseball parade, the Cersei parade, and we did a educational form for Reed's Bridge, which is Canada down there. You've pretty much met yourself coming and going in the last month. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm going to add a plug on the uh, 10 Mile House because that's going out five, right before you get to the interstate. Yeah, Stagecoach Road. Stagecoach Road, and it still has a rural feel in there, or did the last time I went through. And, and of course, that's where they had David of God, the child martyr for the Confederacy, the prisoner there. And they took him from there to be executed. Very historic site. Appreciate y'all being uh, helping to rededicate the marker. Um, walk through history coming up. Nine years ago, uh, Historical Society worked with the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, and we did a walk through history at Judsonia. Uh, they called us late last year and said because the, I'll get this term wrong, but the bridge that crosses the river at Judsonia is now reopened and has been restrengthened, uh, they wanted to do a walk through history at Judsonia. So hopefully we have more of this beautiful weather. And on October the 12th, that's a Saturday, Saturday, October 12th, uh, I think the parking will be at the Methodist Church at Judsonia. And if you turn at the first stoplight on the old highway and go to the right, uh, you know, the first church you hit will be the Methodist Church, right downtown Judsonia. Uh, I know they will walk, to, or we will walk to the bridge, and then I think there's talk of walking on back up toward the community center, which is the only historic district we have in Arkansas, in White County. So mark October 12th, and pray that we have as beautiful a weather as we've had the last couple of days, and come on out to walk through Judsonia. Uh, historic preservation has been very good on supporting us in this. I uh, introduced him last month, but we have an official videographer. Will, stand up or wave your hand or something. There's a camera back there. The guy with the camera, Will Walker, Harding student, 
has agreed to video videograph or videotape our meetings, and we're really grateful to Will for this. And uh, so uh, he's, he's going to be in the back with the camera. So if you have to look that way, smile. Okay? Uh, do we have any first time visitors tonight? That no one put people on the spot, but. Tom, you're not a first time. <laughs> anyway, um, the um, election of officers will come up in November when we elect officers for the coming year. Uh, Mary Beth Waters has been our president for the last, I believe, three years. She is, I have not had an update today, but it was a Friday day, gone to the hospital for some testing, taking possibly heart. Uh, it's also had a daughter in an accident. Her mother's health is not good. It's kind of been one thing after another. So uh, for the next year's president, the board tonight suggested that uh, I be the nominee for 2014 for president, that Sam Holloway continue as vice president, treasurer Georgia Rogers, and uh, secretary Shelley Keach. Uh, the two board members that are up are uh, Scott Acreage and Leroy. Uh, player. So uh, we'll be uh, voting on uh, officers for 2014 at the November meeting, but we need to announce that the September and October meeting. Um, as I said at the beginning, I'm a little discombobulated this evening. Does anyone else have any announcements? Elizabeth, I didn't call you. I apologize. <laughs> Skipped right over you. Don't be scared. I'm taking out a piece of paper. <laughs> but it's just because I don't want to forget these things. Um, since our last meeting, as Tom said, uh, the uh, New Spirit participated in the Fair Parade as well as our Pioneer Village group. We had a great time. It was August Blue Blazes that day. He, <coughs> he's up there shaking his head. But we didn't lose anybody, so that was good. Um, we're going to have a flag presentation at Pioneer Village. The date is still a little in the air, but I want to throw it out there so you can be on the lookout for it. The Woodmen of the World have presented to Pioneer Village a flagpole and are giving us two flags from the 1800s. Now they're new flags, they're reproduction flags, but they're of that era. And we will have a formal presentation at the village, so um, if it is after our next meeting, I'll let you know next meeting, but be on the lookout because it will be advertised in the paper and um, I mean, published in the paper, not official advertising, but uh, we'd love for everybody to come out for that. Today I received a call from the Democrat asking, um, the Arkansas Democrat asking some questions about our upcoming open house, and we will be featured as one of the things to do in Arkansas, um, I believe on October the 2nd, I just went to be published. I think it's on that big calendar page, best I could get because she kept saying the family page where they put that every day of the month that have things that you could do. So we will be um, presented to the state on that page. So that's pretty exciting. We have our open house coming November 2 and 3. We talked about that before. So please put that on your calendars. We also need some pumpkins and gourds. Does anybody have access to some pumpkins that we could borrow at least for the open house. We we don't have any use for them after the open house is over, but if you do have or know the source that we could borrow, oh say a couple of dozen pumpkins of various sizes and gourds, please let me know after the meeting. Stan, I want you to cover your ears. Stan is uh, Elizabeth's husband because I don't want Stan to hear that if we paid Elizabeth for the hours that she puts in a Pioneer Village, we couldn't afford her. She's many hours. Much appreciated. Stan, you can hear from you. I did because I love it. Well, we appreciate you very much. Uh, we do have a guest tonight. She's kind of hidden behind a pole over here. Uh, Mary Miller, if you have any contact with the Independence County Historical Society or the Independence County Genealogical Society. Uh, this is a lady that you will meet. She's been busy in the last year, along with Sue Richards, Richardson, Richmond, sorry, um, 
they have just gained a uh, historic marker for the very historic Walnut Grove Cemetery, which is, Walnut Grove is still on the map, but it's one of those that that's most of what you can say. It's on the map, and there is a cemetery there. I spent hours and hours on it. And uh, Mary is really a stalwart in Independence County, and we appreciate her being with us tonight. And I think she's going to have a little announcement for us. Mary? What he didn't tell you was we got that cemetery on the National Register. Okay. Get a little closer to it. Don't be We got that cemetery on the National Register, and we're very proud of that. It was a lot of work. And I'm wearing a different hat here tonight. You know that little story about Bartholomew Cummings and his 500 hats? He had a different hat for every occasion. This is my Civil War hat. The Batesville Area Civil War Roundtable is going to host a visit to Helena, the site of the Battle of Helena, on October 19th, and we hope it will be a pretty day. The cost for the trip, including all the entrance fees and your lunch, is $45. We're going to leave Batesville at 7 a.m., so it'll be about 8 when we get down here to Searcy. If any of you want to go with us, you're most welcome. And we'll get back home probably about 6 o'clock. We're going to leave the cemetery in Helena at 3.30. And we have a little schedule here. It's something y'all want to keep at. And if you can join us, we'd love to have you. Uh, Mary, a couple of things. Uh, where will the bus, I know, you know yet where you'll stop here in Searcy? No. Okay. Uh, but if you, if you get us some people, we'll figure out a way. Okay. Uh, you, Scott, and myself for contact, and uh, this, it'll be a fun day. Yeah. It'll be great. So. We hope we have three or four bands. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming down and visiting with us tonight. Our speaker tonight is a very interesting fellow, and I'm sure there's many stories on it. I don't know how many I'm going to have, or Scott Akers is going to tell. Scott's going to introduce our speaker. <laughs> this could be trouble. <laughs> our speaker tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, Dr. Jamie Brandon, who is an archaeologist at Southern Arkansas University in Magnolia. He has been at SAU since 2006. He has worked for the Arkansas Archaeological Survey since 1995 in various capacities. He has a bachelor's degree from uh, Memphis State, now the University of Memphis, an MA from the uh, University of Arkansas, and his PhD was from the University of Texas at Austin. So I'm a little conflicted when it comes to that whole Southwest uh, <laughs> conference thing, guys, just so you know. <laughs> but he has worked on archaeological projects all over the Southeast. Thirteen different states have uh, seen uh, Jamie. And um, he has worked on sites from Paleo Indian, that's 10,000 years ago roughly, to 20, all the way up to the 20th century and everything in between. But for the last decade, most of his interest has been on 19th century uh, Arkansas archaeology uh, and archaeological sites. He grew up in West Tennessee, but uh, he married an Arkansas girl and uh, considers himself an, an Arkansan now. He is vice chairman of the Civil War Sesquicentennial uh, Commission. And uh, most of y'all are well aware that we have put up a half a dozen historic markers in the last uh, couple of years uh, here in White County. And uh, uh, one of our most active counties in the entire state we're putting up. So, Yes. Uh, we, we're really trying very hard to get a marker in every county, so you guys have clearly <coughs> cleared the bar. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, he has worked at Washington, what we used to call Old Washington State Park. They now call Washington Historic State Park. He's worked there for, um, well, since 2007, and um, the last not, not this summer, but the two previous summers, he directed the Arkansas Archaeological Society's annual training program, which is a two-week long training program with the volunteers and staff. There are about 130, 140 uh, volunteers and staff that participate in that 
project each June, two weeks, and uh, the, the, this, these last two that he directed were literally in what is now um, just, just lawn in front of the 1836 uh, courthouse, which was the uh, state capitol during the latter part of the Civil War. And, and right across the street from that would have been the business district. And so the archaeology was all in that business district. And he's going he's to mention some of that uh, work in his, in his program. He has traveled uh, nearly four hours to get here tonight. And so he's got uh, an equal amount of time to go back home. Um, but, but he is staying in a hotel tonight. But, but I want you to know he came a long way. To, to, give, to, give, to share his uh, knowledge with you tonight. And uh, the title of the talk, Archaeology and the Civil War in Arkansas. And uh, would you please welcome Mr. Jamie Brandon. Talk to you. I'll answer anything. <laughs> I'm not very big. Oh, I got a nice comment. Can everybody uh, see the screen? And boom, boom. Back up a little bit. Hello. I, I will submit that you will not need me to this use guy, a microphone. He's a very dynamic man. <laughs> Everybody hear me just fine, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Can you back up a little bit? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure enough. How about that? That's right. Thank you. All right. And now I've messed up our videography. He's like, is he in shot? Is he in shot? <laughs> He's in shot. Uh, as Scott said, uh, I am uh, the archaeologist who's at Southern Arkansas University. Uh, but I, I teach there at the college at SAU. But, uh, but I actually work for an organization called the Arkansas Archaeological Survey. Now, some of you may know, because you know Scott, and he's very involved with society. But some of you may not know that we have this organization. We are your archaeologists. Uh, we're kind of like ag extension agents, and I heard you're going to be talking about the history of agricultural extension agents. We're just like ag extension agents in Arkansas, but for archaeology instead of your agriculture. So what does that mean? That means we all work for the University of Arkansas. So even though I'm down in SAU, I work for the U of A. They've stationed me down there like you station a uh, agricultural extension agent in the county that I work for the University of Arkansas. The second thing it means is that if you're a landowner in one of these areas, you have someone to call if you have questions. If you have questions about stuff that you found while you're farming. If you have questions about old farmsteads on your property. If you have questions about protecting cemeteries. We are people who you can call uh, and ask you questions about anything historical, uh, uh, under the ground or somewhat over the ground, that you can think of. Uh, 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 we as an organization, the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, are here uh, for you. Uh, we also work hand in hand with a volunteer organization, just like yourselves the, as a historical society. We have a volunteer organization called the Arkansas Archaeological Society that works with us. We wouldn't be able to, like doing things like what Scott just mentioned, those summer programs, we wouldn't be able to dig half the things we dig without volunteers. People from all walks of life come out to work side by side with us and come to work with artifacts in the lab. Some of the artifacts you'll see tonight. So my research territory is actually southwest Arkansas. I'm stationed here at SAU, and I have the 11 counties uh, in, in southwest Arkansas. My job is to do research to find out what kinds of archaeology are out there in my 11 counties. Uh, and to do public outreach, which is what I'm doing right now, in case you didn't know, uh, giving talks about what it is we do and how we do it, uh, and answering questions of landowners and people who find things. And so every one of these regions has their own archaeologists, and you guys will fall uh, uh, into, where is White County? Right here. Your, your archaeologists will be at ASU in Jonesboro, uh, uh, although you also have one over here in Harkin, Arkansas. So I'm here as, your, uh, as an archaeologist with the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, but I'm also here wearing another hat, talking about having multiple hats. Uh, I'm here because I'm the vice chairman of the Arkansas Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission. Uh, 150th anniversary, if you don't want to say sesquicentennial, which is sometimes pretty good. Uh, now you might be asking, a lot of people would be wondering, what does archaeology, when you think about archaeology, you think about what? Indiana Jones or, or pyramids of Egypt. Or if you're pretty historically savvy, 
like, I don't know, you're a member of a historical society or something. Uh, uh, you, you might think about Native Americans, archaeologists who work on Native American mound sites in the Delta or, uh, uh, or find arrow points and things like that. We do that. But there's also another kind of archaeology that's interested in the very recent past. And as Scott alluded to, I've been for the last decade interested in 19th century uh, 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 archaeology here in Arkansas. You might think, well, we got written records. Why would you need to dig up 19th century Arkansas? But our written records have very particular points of view. Uh, 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 rich folks get to write the history records, uh, but nor regular folks, uh, poor folks, people of color, women, don't get in their history books as much. And so archaeology, digging up stuff like old farmsteads, can tell us a lot that we didn't know. Even we don't know a lot about rich folks' everyday life, because they didn't write about what they were eating every day for breakfast. So uh, we can learn a lot that we did not know about history by doing archaeology on these historic sites. Uh, uh, tonight, what I'm going to do is give you a survey of a particular kind of historic archaeology because we're doing the sesquicentennial. I'm going to be giving you uh, examples of archaeology in the Civil War period and what we can learn and how we go about learning what we learn using these sites. In fact, in honor of the 150th anniversary, back in 2011, the theme for Arkansas Archaeology Month was Archaeology of Conflict. Uh, you didn't know we had an Arkansas Archaeology Month, did you? March is Arkansas Archaeology Month. Next time March rolls around, look around and see if there's going to be some archaeology programs going on. You guys should invite another archaeologist to come speak in March for Archaeology Month. Uh, 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 because that is our Archaeology Month. But this type of archaeology, what we call conflict archaeology, is a kind of subdiscipline, if you will, of historic archaeology that's becoming more and more important uh, 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 as, uh, as we grow into uh, a discipline. Um, the most obvious kinds of sites that conflict archaeologists will study are battlefields and military encampments and forts. But actually the field's a lot broader than that, and I'm going to try to give you some feel for that uh, tonight. It's bigger than military engagements. Uh, archaeologists who study conflict uh, may also study uh, evidence of prehistoric Native American warfare, uh, racial and cultural conflict, settlement disputes, even workplace violence. And archaeologists who study conflict may look for all different kinds of evidence, like defensive structures, like forts. Uh, they'll also look for trauma and skeletal remains, like the CSI folks do, uh, uh, burning, and, and even certain kinds of settlement patterns that are for defense. And we've got some new high tech. Uh, ways of looking underneath the ground. I'll show you some examples of that tonight, too, that help us uh, understand better what's going on. We don't have to dig quite as much as we used to. We can figure out where buildings used to be, where roads used to be, and even sometimes where troop movements were and activities on battlefields. Now, the National Park Service has been really active in using archaeological techniques on a number of their battlefield sites. And the best known is not from the Civil War. It's from the Indian Wars out west. That's the Battle of the Little Bighorn, you know, Custer's last stand. Um, and the Little Bighorn archaeological investigations were used to completely reinterpret specific elements of the battle. Uh, that led, in turn, historians going back to the documentary record and asking whole new sets of questions. And now uh, we know that battle very differently than we knew it uh, before about 1990. Now, closer to home and in our era of the Civil War, uh, archaeology has also aided uh, in the interpretation at uh, Civil War battlefields such as Pea Ridge in northern Arkansas and Wilson's Creek in Missouri, where a lot of Arkansans fought and died. Uh, using uh, uh, some software called Geographic Information Systems that plot, that plot particular artifacts on the landscape so we can make a great map of these things that are tied into real space, uh, using stuff like that, we were able to uh, uh, identify physical features and artifacts and test some interesting ideas uh, from the historical record. The archaeology of battlefields like Pea Ridge, Wilson's Creek, and Prairie Grove can tell us a lot that we did not know about military history uh, and the daily life in troops in the war. Now, just like I was just saying about normal history, military history is a lot like that. If you think about it, you have sort of official histories. Uh, like the war, the records of the War of Rebellion. Uh, those are uh, written by generals and commanders, and they have a very particular story to tell. Usually it's to shirk blame and to make sure somebody else gets blamed for the failure. Uh, um, uh, uh, so they may not actually be quite as straightforward as you think. Uh, and then you have a lot of letters 
You guys have all seen annotated letters back from the front uh, uh, from troops that were serving in the war. And those can tell you a lot of cool information. But they sometimes don't see the big picture because they are soldiers on the ground. And they don't quite see the whole big picture that you're looking for. Archaeology, if it's carefully done, uh, mapping and documenting each and every find in place, can help follow troop movements. Uh, such as these around, uh, around the battlefield and even can uh, shed light on uh, what types of weapons they were using. Uh, sometimes, in this case, uh, this 12-pound howitzer at Pea Ridge that was actually not supposed to have been there, belonged to it, it alerted us, the fact that we had these canisters, alerted us to the fact that an entire uh, uh, group uh, 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 of soldiers were there that we had thought had been in Fort Smith at the time. Uh, uh, so this is a great example of what archaeology Another great example of this kind of archaeology at Wilson's Creek, uh, it, it comes from Wilson's Creek, and at Wilson's Creek, archaeologists surveyed almost half of the battlefield and found thousands, all these little dots, thousands and thousands of artifacts uh, relating to the battle, and we recorded them with very precise locations. Now, these artifacts give historians a lot of information that we don't, didn't have about the battle, and they even help us confront historic myths uh, one of those myths, uh, 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 an example of one of those myths, is the fact that Confederate forces, especially those in Arkansas and the Trans-Mississippi South, uh, went to war with nothing more than squirrel guns. Now that phrase, nothing more than squirrel guns, is a phrase that John Gould Fletcher, poet laureate of Arkansas, <coughs> uses when he's describing Arkansas in the Civil War in his history of the state. Uh, but archaeologists working at Wilson's Creek found that every single bullet that they found, Union or Confederate, with the exception of a single bullet, belonged to military weapons. Uh, now, if you think about this, this kind of makes sense early in the war because the South was actually able to capture lots of arsenals, like the arsenal at Little Rock uh, that almost set off the war before uh, uh, before uh, 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 South Carolina did. Um, uh, uh, so, but it's later in the war as it drags on without the manufacturing that the South is at a disadvantage when it comes to weapons. But this is brought to the fore by doing archaeology on sites such as these. Now, one of the archaeologists that worked at Wilson's Creek and Pea Ridge is now my research assistant down in Magnolia. His name is Carl Drexler. And last fall, Carl and I launched a project to locate the Battle of Wallace's Ferry, or Big Creek, near Helena. Uh, um, it's about a four-hour skirmish uh, in which Union infantry are pinned down by Confederate cavalry. Now we had lots and lots of historic maps, uh, uh, and we had action reports, and we had the opinions of local historians, and we had the opinions of local archaeologists about where the battle site might be. And what I can hear to tell you tonight is, it's not where everybody thinks it is. Uh, our first foray into the field didn't find the actual skirmish site. Um, now that may seem like a defeat on the surface, but that's actually how archaeology works. We start out. Uh, if this battle had been where everybody had thought it would be, we wouldn't necessarily have had to do the archaeology. Um, what it tells us when we found, when we didn't find it where everyone thought it was going to be, it tells us that something we, there's something we don't know about the historic record. There's something that's not in the maps, that's not in the action reports. And when we're going back this, this fall, uh, this next fall, and when we do locate the site, and I'll show you an example of like sometimes it takes more than one time to do it, we will have learned something that we did not know about how the landscape has changed in the area or how, or something that was left out of historical documents. And that's how archaeology works. That's how all science works. We start and we try and we have a question and we try to answer it. But I've heard that this is us looking and not finding uh, Wallace's Ferry. I like to think that archaeology of the Civil War is a lot more than just the archaeology of battlefields. If you think about it, battles are less than 1% of the experienced time of soldiers uh, during, uh, during the Civil War. Uh, they spend a lot of time not on the battlefield. Uh, uh, and archaeologists can tell us a lot about what daily life was like for soldiers in these moving cities. And when I say moving cities, if you think about it, some of these, some of these armies are 20,000 strong, and that would have been one of the largest metropolitan areas in the state of Arkansas during the Civil War. Uh, and these are literally moving cities, wandering around, eating up everybody else's corn and, 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 uh, and food, uh, uh, and, and they are to be thought of that way. 
Now, doing archaeology is sort of like uncovering new primary documents. Uh, uh, this is information that we didn't have anywhere else that we're able to do it, but you have to document it carefully. Um, and you think about it, it's sort of like a crime scene. Uh, uh, if you find, uh, if, if I walk into a crime scene, there's a dead body on the ground and there's a gun laying on the floor. If I pick up that gun, I have the gun. That's a cool thing. It's a gun. It's probably the murder weapon. Uh, um, uh, but it doesn't tell me as much. That is, like in CSI, when the people walk in, what do they do? They cordon everything off. They photograph everything in place. They document the gun's relationship to the body, the gun's relationship to other things in the room. Because then you can solve the crime. Then you can tell the story. And just like that, if we don't do this kind of documentation, uh, uh, we lose part of the information that we're trying to unravel, part of the story, part of the crime we're trying to solve, we don't get if we, if we get this stuff out of context, which is why archaeologists say context is really, really important. And I'll give you an example, a couple examples about that from the Civil War. The first comes from uh, 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 Confederate Winter's quarters at Cross Hollows that I and the aforementioned Carl were part of when we both worked in Northwest Arkansas back in 2003. And we were trying to help archaeologist Jerry Hilliard uh, 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 find the Cross Holler Winter's Quarters. We were looking for something that looked sort of like this, half cabin, half tent affairs uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that housed the Confederate uh, 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 troops semi-temporarily uh, during the campaign. We had some general idea of where these camps might be. But like my current example in Helena, it took a lot of attempts. It took six or seven field attempts, in fact, before we zeroed in on the camp locations. Finally, we began to understand the historic landscapes, and we were able to find uh, things like uh, uh, Civil War-related artifacts, such as ordnance, uh, and weapon-related artifacts, such as this worm for extracting jammed balls from period rifles, and artifacts that collaborated historical documents such as this pelican button from an officer's cuff or waistcoat that confirms the presence of the 3rd Louisiana Infantry. But we found a lot more than strictly military objects in these camps. We also found lots and lots of nails. If you think, remember, they're kind of half-cabin platform affairs. And we found the nails that held these things together. Uh, uh, as well as uh, everyday items such as uh, forks, including this sort of handmade version up here, uh, uh, that, that told us something about uh, uh, forks and, and, and even butchered animal remains that alerted us to where mess areas and food preparation areas uh, would have been within the camp. Now because we approached this recovery like archaeologists, carefully mapping each and every separate item, we were able to produce uh, uh, maps such as this reconstructing a portion of the, what the winter camp looked like. So you can't quite see this because it's not being projected very large, but all these little dots are artifacts, and we were able to locate two of the platforms here, a cooking area over here, and even a sentry position up here, all because of mapping individual artifacts in space. These are information. This layout, layout of these winter quarters is something that's not in any map, is not in any historical documentation. This is something that archaeology, new information that archaeology has found come to life. But speaking of reconstructing landscapes, uh, there's a, that's also something that archaeology can assist at Civil War period sites. Now, any battlefield site you guys visit, anyone you've ever been to, uh, uh, and even including Civil War period house sites, uh, for that matter, have to deal with the fact that landscapes around them are changing. You guys. In, and seriously, don't need to tell me that. We just went down and saw where uh, uh, the gin was on Gin Creek. It's a you know, city park now. Or the landing, that's a golf course. So clearly, the cultural landscape has rapidly changed here. Seriously. And no matter what you think, there wasn't a Stuckey's uh, and a KOA campground right off of the Gettysburg battlefield uh, when the battle was fought. So uh, these things change. And every one of these historic sites has to balance smart growth with reconstructing the landscape the way they think it was in order to interpret their events. Now, Pea Ridge in Northwest Arkansas is very, very lucky. Uh, it's largely regarded as one of the most undisturbed Civil War battlefields in the National Park Service. Uh, and part of that is due to its rural setting, but it's also a part of the hard work of the park staff. And archaeology is one way that you can gain information about past landscapes that will help reconstruct them. Uh, just this last couple years, we've helped the uh, Pea Ridge Battlefield, the, I mean the Prairie Grove Battlefield, uh, do just that. Um, we're helping them kind of figure out uh, uh, what's going on because unlike 
P Ridge, Prairie Grove's landscape has changed quite a lot. This is a 19th century map of the uh, Prairie Grove area. You see these nice quaint farmsteads. You see uh, uh, pre-Civil War road workways. Um, uh, the farmsteads are now gone. Uh, uh, there's a new highway system, the Eisenhower Highway System, that's taken the place of the 19th century road system. Uh, now this map kind of helps ballpark stuff for it, but in order to actually know where these elements are, uh, and to reconstruct and preserve elements of the original battlefield, uh, we were able to uh, 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 use some of these new high-tech remote sensing technologies that I was telling you about before. We got about six different ways to look under the ground without digging. These are a couple of them, probably ones that you'd be most familiar with. This is ground penetrating radar, as seen on CSI. That's how they find all the bodies on CSI. Uh, it literally shoots radar and up the ground and bounces off hard and soft targets. And this is a magnetometer. Uh, that registers changes in a magnetic field, so metal, for instance, shows up quite a lot on it, but also heavily burned areas uh, will show up on it as well. We use uh, items like these, what we call remote sensing, to help us pinpoint where it is that we want to dig. So, for instance, if I show you this little blob, this streak here, this is some of that remote sensing data, I see this streak here, and it may not look like anything. A lot of these things look like Rorschach tests. Uh, uh, for archaeologists, but if you look at it, uh, uh, what it is, in fact, is a portion uh, of, uh, 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 of a landscape with a little streak through it. And if you string enough of these together, you sure enough have reconstructed the uh, Prairie Grove to Cane Hill Road, which was important in the Battle of Prairie Grove. And then we can help use this locational data to be able to figure out where things are according to uh, uh, 1860s landscapes. And then we can zero in on farmsteads that used to exist in the area and do a little bit of excavation in order to uncover where those farmsteads were, like here at the U. Rogers place. Of course, when we do these excavations, we found artifacts related to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 the, the battle itself, but we also found lots of artifacts that tell us about what 19th century life was like in general during the war. And speaking of 19th century life, archaeologists can tell us a lot about what's going on on the home front during the Civil War, uh, uh, on the daily life of ordinary Arkansans in this incredibly difficult time in Arkansas history. And we've done archaeology all over the state at sites from the mid-19th century that tell us a lot. For instance, we were did archaeology to uh, help restore Lake Fort Plantation in Chico County. And that's a, 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 a plantation house that actually its construction is interrupted by the war. Uh, it started in the antebellum period and not finished until after the war is gone. We did lots of excavations at the old state house during its renovations in the 1990s that found evidence of occupation of Union troops after 1864. But I want to leave you with a couple examples from my own work. And this is uh, uh, some of the stuff that Scott was referring to earlier. Uh, I had the honor in 2011 and 2012 of directing uh, the Society Dig, the summer training program uh, in Historic Washington State Park. How many people have been to Historic Washington State Park? Uh, this far north, that's great. I gave a talk in Jonesboro about a year ago, and nobody raised their hand. So you guys are very historical-minded, good for a historical society. Uh, uh, when I usually give the shot, uh, I usually have to tell people a little bit about Washington. This is an 1845 map of Washington. You can see here the star on the Southwest Trail, uh, which you guys are on the other end of. Um, it's a great historic state park filled with these antebellum homes. We've been doing archaeology since the 1980s at Historic Washington State Park, but these last, these last two summers, what I wanted to focus on was something a little bit different. This nice big blank lot in between the giant magnolia, for those of you who've been there, you remember the giant magnolia, right? And the 1836 courthouse. Uh, the, as Scott mentioned, the 1836 courthouse, uh, following the fall, <coughs> or liberation, depending on how you look at the Civil War, of Little Rock, uh, becomes the Confederate capital of Arkansas. And you can imagine the scene where all of those legislators and all of those legislative documents and all of those books get piled up into uh, a wagon train and rushed down the Southwest Trail to set up shop in this tiny town uh, on the edge. The, the population of Washington goes from like 2,000 to almost 20,000 overnight. You count all the legislators, all their accoutrements, and even the soldiers that are sent there to protect Washington. Uh, it swells up quite a lot, and this becomes the hub of, a, a hub of activity for the later part of the war. 
Across the street from it was the old mercantile district, the mercantile district from the 1830s until uh, the, uh, the 1870s when fire destroys uh, uh, this block and the town moves uh, further to the south. Now, on this empty block that they now use to, that we're reenactors now use to drill, uh, um, uh, we were able to use some of that remote sensing technologies, and it showed me a lot of things. For instance, you see that big square there, right? See that big square right here? It shows up in a couple technologies. This is in uh, uh, resistance, passing electric electricity through the ground. This one is in ground penetrating radar. Uh, but it shows up in a couple things. Uh, that really big square belongs to a building that nobody knew was there. Uh, we don't have a single map of this block and we don't have a single photograph of this block from the 19th century. So this was all new to us. And so we were wondering what was this really large square. And we also had other areas that we were very interested in excavating using these little blocks as well. What we found when we began excavating over those two years was lots and lots of below ground architecture that helped us reconstruct what that mercantile district looked like. And what you're seeing in this shot is a large 1860 cistern uh, with a filter box where the, fil where, the, where the water came down a downspout through a charcoal filter and into the cistern. And you can see the foundations of an 1860s house uh, uh, or business right here uh, attached to it. But in the artifacts that we found, uh, 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 we found several related to the Civil War. In fact, in that big square, which turned out to be a merchant warehouse, uh, we found things like this eye button, uh, which would have been a Confederate infantry button late in the war. Uh, uh, this makes perfect sense if you think about it. The, not only is the Confederate government, I'm messing with your videographer by walking around, uh, uh, not only is the Confederate government take up, taking up residence just across the street, but even those soldiers in the area are going to use that mercantile district as a quartermaster system. And they're going to use those merchants as much as they can to help outfit uh, uh, what they can out of the units. And so it would make sense to find uh, uh, military accoutrements here uh, on the, the front. Folks like these are the Hempstead Rifles who were mustered out of Washington, some, did the, some of the early fighting up at Wilson's Creek to sort of bring the circle all the way around from Wilson's Creek to Wilson's Creek. The last example is an example from my own dissertation work in northwest Arkansas, and it's a little town, it's a little place called Van Winkle's Mill. It's one of those places like you guys were talking about that doesn't exist anymore. But in the 19th century, it was a big sawmill community. It was the biggest sawmill community in northwest Arkansas. It built, it's the, it's the, it's the lumber that built Old Main at the University of Arkansas. It's the lumber that built the courthouse in Benton County. It's the lumber that built the railroad towns of Rogers and Eureka Springs right after the war. It was a very important uh, town. Uh, um, uh, here's a picture of the mill in the 1870s. Uh, and the man who founded it, Peter Marcellus Van Winkle. Uh, the mill was also run uh, by sl uh, slave labor, and after the war, after emancipation, African Americans stayed on and worked at the mill. Um, uh, during the war, Peter Van, uh, Peter Van Winkle fled to Texas. Now, the history of Benton County will say he fled to Texas because he thought the war was wrong and both sides were bad. Now, there are lots of things I can say about this, uh, uh, but I think that's not quite truthful about how Peter felt about this. And I think, as our historians, we should just be truthful. Uh, uh, Peter uh, was a slaveholder. Now, that's, that could be economic. That's not, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean he was pro-Confederate. He contracted with the Confederate government to build barracks. He built the barracks at Cross Hollows that we found in 2003. Uh, that could be an economic decision. He lent them mules. That could be an economic decision. But what they've never been able to explain to me is why Jefferson Davis Van Winkle and Robert E. Lee Van Winkle are his two sons that were born during the Civil War. It's not very bipartisan. Now, one of them in Grant or Sheridan or something. It's clearly, he has a clearly ideological, uh, he's clearly on the side of the Confederacy, and we shouldn't even mince about this. We, we know it's true. Uh, uh, but we, we somehow feel uncomfortable about that. But Peter Van Winkle is a, is a very important person in the period, and he leaves, and when he returns, after the war, he finds that his mill has been burned to the ground, and a lot of its accrued, and his house has been burned to the ground, and lots of the things around the area have been burned to the ground. And he rebuilds. And he rebuilds fast enough that he becomes a major player in the 1870s. But by 1900, he is dead, and Van Winkle's mill is history and no longer existing. So this is, uh, this is a brief moment in time, and we did a lot of archaeology in the area to uncover. This is a, a nostalgia photograph called The Old South uh, of uh, Friedman, taken in 1910. This character right here is Sam Van Winkle. He's one of the Sawyers who worked at Van Winkle's mill. 
We did archaeology all over Van Winkle's Mill, starting in the late 90s and going through 2009. Uh, we dug at Peter's house. We dug at the mill site. We dug at the blacksmith shop. We found a post-emancipation workers' quarters, and we even found a possible slave quarter. We even found an old mule paddock. If you wonder archaeologically what a mule paddock looks like, it looks like a whole bunch of mule shoes and just some really big penny nails used to slap the lumber together. That's all you get. That's a mule paddock. Uh, and we were able to do archaeology all around this area. Um, it, but interestingly, what we found is sort of a, 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 an interesting pattern. Now, this is the forge from the blacksmith shop at Van Winkle's Mill. Uh, this is the 1870s forge. Archaeologists, when we find dark soil, we think artifacts. When we see light soil, we think we're getting into areas without a lot of artifacts. Because when humans live in a place for a long time, we put a lot of organics into the soil. The soil gets dark. You guys who garden know all about that, right? Dark soil is good. Um, so this is the 1870s blacksmith shop. And then you get into some light stuff that we just thought, oh, well, we're out of it. And then all of a sudden you see a dark streak down there. That's the 1850s, the pre-war, the antebellum blacksmith shop that was burned to the ground by the Confederates who were leaving the region. Uh, uh, they, they burned things. You go, why were the Confederates burned Van Winkle's Mill? Because they didn't want it to fall into, it's, it's very important, the military material, that they didn't want to fall into the Union hands. And so when Peter comes back, he rebuilds right on top of his old blacksmith shop, his new blacksmith shop. We see that as well uh, uh, at the main house. We see that as well at the mill. Where we don't see it is in the slave quarters and the, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, emancipated freedmen's quarters. Uh, they move. And I think there's a difference between some people wanting to remember things, wanting to reinvent themselves and do something different. And the archaeology that we see at uh, the antebellum workers' quarters, this is the antebellum workers' quarters, shows some life on another part of the story of the Civil War, and that is the emancipation of African Americans. You see this is a dog truck house with two chimneys on each end. Probably a dog truck, judging by its long. It could just be two pins, but I'm going to bet it's probably a dog truck with a chimney on each end. Uh, all of the artifacts that we excavated from here date to 1870. Um, so it's clearly only post-emancipation. We believe it is occupied by this man right here. This is Aaron Anderson Van Winkle. This is the only photograph I have of Aaron. Uh, uh, he was uh, born uh, enslaved in Alabama, who was brought here uh, to Arkansas uh, uh, by Colonel Hugh Anderson, and at some point gets transferred to, uh, to uh, Peter Van Winkle. The only picture I have is from the Van Winkle family reunion in 1901, where he's standing right behind uh, a temperance Van Winkle, the matriarch of the family. Uh, uh, which is the complicated relationship between uh, the white and black Van Winkles. Um, Aaron Anderson Van Winkle, uh, when he passes, he stays on after the war, becomes a uh, supervisor at the mill. When he passes away, he gets uh, obituaries both in white and black newspapers. So he does very well for himself uh, in climbing the social ladder. But the things that we find compared to the slave quarter that we excavated versus the, the, uh, this, versus the emancipation, uh, the post-emancipation quarters are like night and day. A lot of things that point to a different life than Aaron Anderson Van Winkle wants for his family and friends. And weirdly, a lot of it has to do with buying stuff. Now, you may think that's weird, but think about how we express our individual identities. You know who you, we know who we are by the kind of cell phone you have, the kind of SUV you drive, right? There's a certain thing, the clothes you wear, uh, uh, this tells us about your personal identity. The same thing is true for Aaron and his family. So while we don't find a lot of personal goods at all in the slave quarters, we find a lot of things like this is a brass pocket knife, bolster plate cover with a little rabbit on it at uh, uh, the post-bellum workers' quarters that Aaron's at. But probably the most striking thing we find uh, uh, at Aaron Anderson's house is the number of children's toys. He spends a lot of money on children's toys. Um, here we see alphabet plates up here, fragments of doll fragments. Uh, uh, you see a cast iron cat pistol fragment, um, clay marbles, and even small Bakelite rings in children's sizes. Uh, I've dug all different kinds of uh, 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 households from the same period, and I've seen more. These are only a sample. I've seen more kids' toys out of this place than I've seen in other tenant farmer sites or poor white folks sites uh, uh, across Arkansas. I think this clearly, although I have to jump to make some interpretation, I think this clearly shows that Aaron wants a different childhood for his kids than he had as he was enslaved. And this is one way that he could do it for them. This cast iron cat pistol fragment alone is like a, is like a buck 50 in, in 1870. That's a lot of money. 
Um, some of those artifacts even are more poignant. These alphabet plates and things like these slate pencils speak directly to teaching the kids to read and write, which is something that wasn't outright illegal in Arkansas, but was absolutely very discouraged amongst African Americans before emancipation. And Aaron clearly wants his kids to be one of the first generations of black folks in Arkansas to be able to read and write. He himself reports on the census that he's illiterate. So I think this is a pretty poignant set of artifacts that points to something going on here. So those are different kinds of stories. Everything from battlefields all the way to home front stories that archaeology can help tell about during the Civil War. Uh, 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 and uh, I think when you came in here, you probably didn't immediately think about archaeology when you think about the Civil War. But I hope from now on, when you think about it, you'll think about it, every site you go to, that there is something archaeologists can tell us about these sites. Uh, and archaeology can be an important part of doing historic uh, research on these Civil War period sites. Uh, I've put up on here uh, the website for the Arkansas Civil War Sesquicentennial. That's ArkansasCivilWar150.com. Uh, it, it is a great clearinghouse. Some people were asking me about uh, ancestors who fought in Arkansas. You can look up those things on this site. You can see all different kinds of events that are going on, including every time you guys dedicate a, uh, a marker here, uh, that goes on our, our calendar. So it's a nice clearinghouse for all different kinds of things that are going on with the Arkansas Sesquicentennial. And we only got a couple more years before the Sesquicentennial is over. So let's get out there and, uh, and celebrate uh, and, uh, and look at the war. Uh, uh, in these next couple of years. I'm happy to answer any and all questions anybody has. Yeah? You talked about Washington. I read the book, is that the same uh, archaeological work that Yeah, well actually that book was published before this set of archaeological digs, but we've been working there since 1979, 1980. Uh, so that book, Digging for History at Old Washington by Mary Claus, is an excellent book that says some of the things that we found. Before uh, now, most of our work is concentrated on households because you know each one of those is you got a standing house, but they used to have all different kinds of outbuildings out back, uh, detached kitchens and barns and everything. And we did a lot of reconstruction work with those, and so there's a lot of that in there, and cool stuff uh, uh, that we found. But this is some of the first public um, uh, area uh, archaeology that we've done. Uh, but uh, that is a great book, uh, a great cocktail, cool artifacts. Yes. Did you? Uh I can see the documentary about the one in Shiloh, or Town of Parks over Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, I know those guys who do uh, uh, who work over there in Shiloh they, uh, quite a lot. They kind of blew their mind about born and Yeah, yeah, and, and it, 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 this is the part of uh, the amount of reinterpretations that we can do because, like I said, the historic documents are not invaluable, as we all know. That's why historians argue about this over and over again. Uh, well, you know why they uh, said what they said about it. Unions afterwards. Yeah. People kept inflating and inflating yeah. the story. And, and this is a, and this is very common with the Civil War. Is it, is it's filtered through all of those re all that oral history because our, our solid stuff really gets formed in the 20, 1920s, right? And so and there's a lot of time to inflate the stories quite a bit. And who wants to tell the veteran? That's not the way it was. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. <laughs> uh, so, but this is a way that we have. And it's not to say that every time we dig, we say. The historic record was wrong. Usually, it's just we're interpreting it wrong, uh, uh, and it just gives us another set of documents to look at alongside and try to collaborate and see what's going on. With this. Uh, and that's what I think is going on with the uh, with the little skirmish outside of Helena, uh, uh, Big Creek. Is I think it's not that the historic documents are wrong. I think we haven't been looking at them right because something has changed uh, on the landscape, and so now we have to go back and reassess. We think we got a good idea of what's happening. Uh, Do you know where the old road is now? I think so, yes. Or at least fragments of it. Yeah. Other questions? Yes? How much does flooding from the rivers and so on the creeks sure. cause your thing to be hard? Well, creeks and rivers do two things. They either wash everything away or they bury it. Burying it isn't fine <laughs> because that protects it. Uh, from all the other things that could happen. If it buried it and then it's plowed, even chisel plowed for a few years, we're probably still going to be okay, right? Because you get this nice buffer zone built up. The washing away part's much more chuck. And it's not as bad, uh, it's not as bad in pumps of the Ozarks, but, but down where I am on the Red River and we're and over on the Mississippi and in the lower portions of the White and the St. Francis, you get a lot of that knocking things out. So uh, we have to worry about it. But I tell you, I just got finished working in a place called Dooley's Ferry, which is a very, we did work there for three years. 
very important crossing on the Red River. There's Civil War fortifications all around it. It's the last gasp of defense uh, of Arkansas. Uh, and uh, there wouldn't be much of Arkansas left, obviously. It's down there on the Red. But, um, but it's still there, all there, right there at the crossing, even though the river has moved like a mile further down. Uh, so it, sometimes it can be there, but sometimes it's not. It really depends on the situation. Other questions? Some military historians now are comparing it to is how everything fell out from uh, Iraq or, Pas uh, pa uh, or Pakistan or Afghanistan uh, when all of a sudden there's no rule of law, there's no economy, there's no currency, there's no anything. That's what it was like here during the Civil War. It was a major impact to us and, and everything you counted on, the merchants couldn't get credit to have food to sell you. You didn't have money that could be valued to buy it. Uh, there were lots and lots and lots of problems. And if you were, even if you were a subsistence farmer, you had those armies of folks running around taking all of your corn every time you turned around. So it was, it's hard for us to imagine because we, are, we haven't had that kind of trauma in invasion terms since, you know, 1812 and then the Civil War. But a lot of things, if you think about how society falls apart, like in Europe during World War II or in Iraq after we invaded Iraq, that's the kind of trauma society completely breaking down and was going up here and south. It was tough. So yes, eating leaves of, of plants, that's quite but understandable. They, they weren't poisoned because they actually used berries for food. Yeah, yes, well, yes, yes. yes. That's why they, yeah. they were pretty sure that the leaves Something was okay. would be alright. Although pulp works the other way around. Don't eat berries. Eat the leaves. Other questions? I'll be around for a while. If anyone wants to ask any individual questions, I have cards if you're interested in cards. But go visit the Arkansas Civil War 150 website and see what's going on with that. And if you're interested in archaeology, see Scott. Uh, and he can plug you into the local Arkansas Archaeological Society's chapters and what, what's up with that. So thank you all. And uh, as a small token of our appreciation, uh, we, we, we're going to present you uh, a book uh, by uh, two, back in 1996, two co-partners in crime uh, about the local uh, battle at Whitney's Lane and the military occupation of White County by Powers and Acreage. <laughs> <laughs>
again, watch the newsletter for the October program, and we appreciate your attendance. We are dismissed.